And now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit our tables? Uh, every week, we like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we attended, and any other cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog version of This Week in Review at TabletopBellhop.com under On Our Tabletop. Uh, so I got quite a pile of games this week, and I am going to start off with one I don't even own, and that is Zombicide Invader. Now, this past Monday, my friend Mike taught four of us, the five total counting him, to play his copy of Zombicide Invader. Now, this was that Kickstarter copy that Mike lent me, and I did a big unboxing video for later in earlier in the week. I think it went a week ago Monday at this point. Uh, this is a huge box with a ton of content, and I'm still amazed Mike actually let me hold on to the game as long as I did, because he has been itching to play it. And now that I've opened everything up for him, he's like, we got to play. So do check out our YouTube channel where we have a giant unboxing video where we look through the vast quantity of miniatures and content that came for this game. Yeah, it took an over an hour and 45 minutes to record it all. Thankfully, Sean was able to edit that down, but it's still quite a long video. Now, Mike taught Sean... Uh, Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton, uh, Tom, Deanna, and myself the game, and we played through just the first scenario. I gotta admit, it was a very long teach. Uh, it was a bit of a rough teach. I think Mike needs to watch our episode on teaching games before I have him teach anything else again. Uh, but we did have a bit of fun playing the game. Overall, I found this new Zombicide game to be the best of the bunch so far. Uh, the one I invested the most time in myself was the previous one with uh, the fantasy theme, and I'm totally drawing a blank on the name of it. Um, there are some cool new elements, rule elements in this version from the previous ones, but the basic mechanics and most of the feel is actually the same. I was actually surprised because some of the me mechanics are identical. Like The types of zombies are actually the same in this, except they're aliens. I did find overall that this version felt more like an adventure game and less of a puzzle. And I got to say, I thought that was a good thing. Now, some of the new things included in Invader are robots that the characters can control. So in addition to your six characters, you have two remote control robots. That was kind of neat. Uh, the game itself set on a space station. And part of that is that part of the board is the space station. The other part is outside. And while you're in space, so when you're outside in space, there's some new rules, like you have to have oxygen. And they did a neat thing where the guns are either energy type or physical ammo type, and the physical ammo ones don't work outside. Though I did find it really weird that you still made noise outside if they were going to try to be scientific. But I don't know. Deanna argued there must be some atmosphere. Whatever. Anyway, um, the other thing that's neat is there's this weird mold that's taking over the ship. I don't know what what sci-fi movie that's trying to be inspired from, but this mold slowly spreads upon the ship and then those can be new spawn points. So that added a big random element to the game that wasn't in the previous versions. Now, for those people who aren't aware or haven't yet uh, had a chance to catch our video, you'll see that this is very inspired by media. So there's yes. a lot of references media. for <laughs> uh, Warhammer 40K, for aliens, for and then they bring in a lot of the miniatures, a lot of the stretch goal miniatures, are actually characters from other, or insp yes. inspired by characters from other uh, things. There are a lot of serial numbers filed off mm -hmm. on characters in this game, but you'll really see a whole lot of aliens and Warhammer 40k inspiration throughout this game. Yeah. To be honest, there's so much of it, and I'm surprised they haven't been sued. Like, like, like they, they, they didn't file the serial. They scratched at him a bit. Like, like there's some stuff that I'm like, wow, I am surprised they got away with this. But I did, again, it is what it is. Uh, one of the things that I was not happy about that they did not fix is yet again, we have another Zombicide game with no campaign play. This has been my complaint about every Zombicide game so far and why I don't have any in my collection. I hate the fact that you've got these 10 scenarios, but every time you reset to zero. Like you pick a new character every time and you start with either a small machine gun or a cattle prod, despite my miniature being big ass guy with a big gun. You start with nothing every game. Like the, the first scenario, we had to steal the gun. You don't get the gun when you play scenario two. I, ah, oh, it drives me nuts. Um, I did end up writing up a full blog post about this one, uh, detailing my initial thoughts. I did have quite a bit more to say about it. Uh, check that out for a more in-depth look. Cause I don't want to dig any deeper here. Now, does Simon do any legacy games? Not yet that I know of. So maybe, maybe if we're, maybe we'll get lucky and uh, 
the Zombicide uh, will be the first one that finally gets a legacy because I don't know. It, uh, yeah, I mean the the idea after watching the the unboxing, and again, I don't, I, I haven't played the game, I haven't played any of the Zombicide games, but I've watched the unboxing and seen all the content, and to think that there isn't any progression Nothing. in that game is mind boggling. Nothing, none. And they put out Arcadia Quest. Arcadia Quest is a campaign game, so they have designers that can do campaign games. In Arcadia Quest, you do reset basically, but you still mark off things, and there's a which way path. If you win this mission, you go here. Like, listen to my our episode on campaign games. That wasn't too long ago. It was like, what, four or five episodes ago? Okay. I get into it. This is not a campaign game. This is a scenario-based cooperative game. Uh, so, the last public play event I hosted at Easy Mode, I attempted to teach the competitive card game Lotus. Uh, I think that was two episodes ago. I, I'll just say here and be nice and polite about it and say it didn't go as well as I had hoped. And I wanted to give the game a second chance with the same group of players. Now, I got that chance Saturday night, and I got to say I'm glad it went much better. Uh, this time, everyone playing was focused on the game and ready to learn it, which was a change from last time. Now, it's not that Lotus is hard to learn, but there are some idiosyncrasies with how scoring works. And that's because the player who completes a flower in Lotus gets all the cards used to create the flower. And each card's worth one point. But it's the player with the most guardians on the petals that unlocks a bonus. And this bonus is five points or the chance to unlock an ability. And it's the two different scoring things that to me actually makes Lotus so fascinating, but there's a lot of strategy and tactics and trying to figure out what cards to play because of this. Like, do you want to play the most of a flower, but then you're taking the risk that someone else is going to complete it and steal it, or it might be worth it if you can make sure you have more guardians. So I don't care if you're going to get the flower. I want the bonus points. Like to me, that's a neat part about it, but it's also the part that's a little hard to teach people. Uh, overall, though, I still really dig it. It is really what I like to call a thinky filler. Uh, thanks, Edward, for Harvey Cardboard for that term. It's a, it's a fantastic term. Uh, this time, all four players really enjoyed the game. They all agreed that this is good. There's enough going on here. I even got thanked for bringing it out and giving it another shot. Yeah, it's interesting there. Uh, the, the score of that on Board Game Geek reflects the sort of difficulty, I think, in, in learning it. Um, it's a six, eight, which isn't bad, That's but not it's bad not at all. great. And I think, uh, probably some people's poor first experiences mm -hmm. are, are lowering that. I, I know that there's a frustration of that, but I have area control. Why do you get to take the cards? Like there's a, there's, you definitely get that aspect, especially during a first play. Now, this past Saturday, we had the pleasure of joining Tori and Kat for another double date night. It's been about a month since we did this, and if we can keep doing this once a month, I'll be very happy, because we had a great time. Uh, we basically did the same thing as last time. We met at the Sandwich Brewing Company, had some great beer, still have the best charcuterie boards in the city, and played some games, starting there and then moving back to our host after. Now, one of the games I brought for this was a brand new, new-to-me game, Pile of Shame Goes Down by One, and that is Imhotep, Builder of Egypt, from the publisher Thames and Cosmos. And this is one of those perfect games for playing during a social event. Uh, something we talked a lot about when we were talking about games at pubs, and Sean liked to, to highlight, is the games where you can not only play and enjoy the game, but also have outside conversations and be social and talk and have fun and have drinks, but still play a game. Uh, we ended up playing Imhotep twice that night, and both games were quite fun. Now, this was another one that I ended up writing up a full initial thoughts review on. Uh, I do suggest checking that out if you want a more detailed look at the game. What I will say here is that it's a really solid gateway family weight game. Uh, it's it's another, it, it could be a, a new Catan. It could be another game to introduce new gamers to gaming. Uh, there are a lot of meaningful decisions to be made. The components are top-notch. Uh, they are they look like your standard resource cubes, but they're about four times bigger, which is nice. And the game boards are all two-sided, and that ramps up the replayability because you can play on either side. Now, there's a mechanical mechanic in this, and Sean may remember playing Zularetto at his house a long time ago. And that's a game where you have you're collecting animals on uh, what do you call them trucks, and you can either put animals on your truck or ship them. And this game's obviously inspired by that because on your turn you're either loading stone blocks onto a ship or shipping those ships to a site in order to score points. But the thing is, you can ship ships that aren't full and you don't even have to have any of your own blocks on there, which makes it really cutthroat where you're shipping other people's blocks to make sure they don't go where you want to go and stuff like that. Um, all four of us really enjoyed Imhotep. I am looking forward to playing this more. Uh, I want to try out the B-sides of the boards. 
Uh, there's also an expansion I'm gonna have in my pile of shame, but I'm gonna wait till I play this one a few more times. This is one I'm definitely gonna be bringing out the easy mode as one of those great intro non gamer to gamer gamers dig it non gamers dig it kind of games. Yeah, no, it's it's only a two uh, it's only a two point oh wait, so you know it's it's accessible, but it's not super simple filler mm. uh, game, which is a really nice way. It's interesting. Uh, they they got a lot of nominations and just not a lot of wins. So I'm wondering, 2016 I think was a a a good year for games, so there was a lot of competition out there for the It won something. Um, it won something, because my game's got a big golden sticker on it saying it won something. Well, it was, it was, uh, that's probably Spiel des Jahres nominee. It's got, because it, it did okay, get maybe. The, I, I don't think it was Spiel, it was something else. Because it I did don't get know. a Spiel it's nominee, but the only, the only thing I see listed for it are nominees. Alright, up next, um... This is once we got back home to our place uh, with Tori and Kat. Tori is a huge fan of deck building games. I think we've mentioned that before. So one of the things I like to do when Tori comes over is show him new deck builders. It's kind of the same thing when Sean comes down. I like to do the same thing because Sean likes deck builders. And I like to show off different ones. So when we got back, I wanted to show off one of the most unique ones in my collection with the alternative motive of I need to play the expansion for it soon. And that's Eminent Domain from Tasty Minstrel Games. Now, this is a sci-fi deck building game it feels like someone took Race for the Galaxy and turned it into a deck build. And the reason for that is that the heart of the system is role selection, where the person who selects the role, the leader gets to do an action, then every other player can do the same action, and the leader gets a bonus, right? Um, the one change in this game compared to, say, Puerto Rico or other games with I Lead You Follow is that in this game you can choose not to follow and draw another card. I, it's called dissenting. I either follow or dissent and I draw a card. Another thing is this is a deck builder where you don't have to discard your hand at the end of your turn. You literally can choose to keep all your hands if you're set up for your next turn, which I said, it, it, it's really neat. And then the other thing is these rules are represented by cards and that's where the main deck building is. So when you choose a role, you take a card represented by that role and it gets added to your deck. So the more you do something, the more cards of that action get added to your deck which in general means you're going to get better and better at that action, but it can also lead to your deck ending up cluttered with extra cards for actions you no longer need. And that's that's a real problem in this game. Uh, I know my first time in, at the end of the game, I was completely toasted because I only had the wrong type of cards for what actually needed to get done to give me a hope. Even though it was something you needed at the beginning. Absolutely. I think you, you overbought yeah. colonization cards, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Now, the other deck building aspect of this game is through buying technologies that's using the research rule. Most technology cards end up in your deck, and they're usually improved versions of the normal actions on the roll cards. Uh, they can also be used to boost two different rolls instead of just one like a normal card. So it's just a couple different ways to use them, and there are some permanent technologies. Uh, that's a really high-level overview of this. I didn't want to dig into all the details of eminent domain, but I will say I still really dig it, uh, mainly because so different from other deck builders like it is not an evolution of dominion in any way i like guess there's a standard mark in the middle um like it, it doesn't feel like star realms it doesn't feel like any of the other sci-fi card games or even non-sci-fi we played two games saturday night uh of the base game the first being a learning game because Tori and Kat had never played it. I would also say a relearning game for Deanna and I, because it had been a while. Uh, and those both went over really well, with the second time being much tighter and more enjoyable. Because I got to say, like, Sean, I think we only played it once. This is definitely one of those games where you need to see it once to fully understand. Yeah, no, especially right. with the, the base game, as I think we're going to get into when you start talking about expansions, uh, there are portions of that game that aren't perfectly well balanced. Yeah. And, and, and learning that your first time through would make a huge difference on your second time through. Very true. Uh, we finished off the night with one more play, and this time we used the Escalation expansion. So this, I was able to get a copy. Thanks, like Mr. The Undead Viking, for giving me a review copy at Origins this year. I've been looking forward to trying this for a long time. This expansion has a ton of new technology cards, a completely updated warfare system with updated rules for the ship counters, because in the base game, the ships just mean they're, they're all just ones. Now each ship is a different type, so you actually have like fighters, battle cruisers, and whatever. Um, and then this really neat scenario system that makes the game asymmetric, so that you actually start with different starting hands, and the ability to play five players. Now at this point, I honestly don't want to say much about Escalation beyond that. Um, I've only played with it once, and as I said, we started at a brewery, and this was the last game of the night. So 
I will save my thoughts on this expansion for when I manage to get a few more plays under my belt and ones with a little clearer head. <laughs> I will just say that I am looking forward to playing it more. Uh, and I have to say, uh, the weakest part of Eminent Domain was definitely the Warfare system. So I think it sounds like, uh, at least based on, on the rough overview, that they've yeah. noticed that and taken efforts to, to uh, fix that. And, uh, well, we'll see when the review comes out whether or not they actually achieved it. Yeah, there was definitely way more going on with Warfare and way more things you could do, but that's I, I couldn't tell you if it was useful or not. <laughs> I, I know I went 100% Warfare and I felt like the game ended too early and I never got to do all the things, but that's probably because I was way too focused on yeah. building ships. But like I said, I, it wasn't the, uh, the best first time playing an expansion, we'll say. All right, well, let's, let's take a look ahead. Now, what do you have planned for the coming week? Uh, so again, as usual, we're talking about two weeks in the future for the podcast. So this this coming weekend, uh, for those of you here live who are in Windsor, I am going to be doing a demo night at CG Realm. Uh, it's only either going to be Imhotep or Dead Man's Cabal. Now the thing is, I was all scheduled, all set to do Dead Man's Cabal, but I know that game came hot off Kickstarter and everything, but they're having a hard time getting it in. So I don't know if that's a Pandasaurus problem, if it's a distributor problem or whatever. I don't know what it is. But the fact they can't get the game in, I don't really want to do a demo night for a game when the store doesn't even have the game for sale. Because I actually think the game's good enough that we might be able to seal, sell a couple copies. So if they can get their shipment in, um, I'm going to find out tomorrow, actually. I'll be doing Dead Man's Cabal. Otherwise, though, I'm going to do Imhotep because I just played it for the first time on the weekend. I'm really digging it. Uh, it's an older game, 2016, so it's something they're likely to have in stock. And I kind of want to show this one off. Now, the following week, that's the 21st of September. This is the one for you guys listening to the podcast. You people listening to the podcast this coming Saturday. We are back at easy mode from 10 till, from 5 p.m. till 10 p.m. Uh, I'm definitely bringing Imhotep as well as a bunch of other lighter games. I'll make sure to bring Terraforming Mars as well because there was a big group that really liked uh, Terraforming Mars last time I was there. So, like I said before, when I try to go to easy mode, I try to bring a mix. We do get a lot of new gamers out. And I say Imhotep's going to be perfect for that, I think. All right. 